Welcome to Asset Horizon, it's Adam here, bringing you another episode of Concepts in Focus. Today, we're taking on a double bill of ideas from your friend and mine, one Matt Stirner, and his ideas of the unique and the creative nothing. Two notions which encapsulate Stirner's account of the individual, its life, and its self-determination. Let's start with the first one, the unique, or the Einziger. The unique is the moment of non-identity in every identification, in every attempt to subsume an individual under the rigidity of a fixed essence or determinate concept, such that this concept or essence would prescribe the limits of an individual's activity in advance, would function to limit the expression of that individual within the bounds of, say, an essence of gender, a natural collection of qualities befitting a good German, a patriot, a godly man, and so forth. This is what Stirner will call a spook or a phantasm, as it stands against the unique. But it must be remembered that the spook is a relation between a rigid ideal or essence and an individual, where one is falsely coerced or deluded into believing in its prescriptive authority and substantiality above oneself as a real principle. Turning back to the unique, however, the unique is indeterminacy and non-identity, as it underlies all forms of identification. It's like a kind of circuit breaker, that when brought to our self-consciousness, and Stirner wants to produce precisely a new self-consciousness of the unique within the individual, can be invoked and held onto as a kind of staging ground for what can only be called an insurrectionary kind of resistance to forms of capture, against rigid forms of self-expression and against dominating forces, all in the name of self-ownership. This self-ownership includes owning the ways in which limits can be transgressed, essences profaned. Self-consciousness of the unique is the beginning by which one seizes the means of practicing selfhood, reserving the means to supersede the constraints of any ideological prescription or determination and to blow it apart from the inside. When one recognizes that one is unique, it is almost as if one attunes to the non-identity at the heart of identity itself. Names do not name you because they are general. And this inability to capture the particular is constitutive of the general itself. There is always a residual and persisting indeterminacy at the core of determination, at the level of the quality of existing, of individuality and the singular. This residual indeterminacy is the primordial root of the being of the individual, the determinate as such. Where can we find this in Stirner? On the final page of the Einziger und Seinigentum, Stirner grants us access to what could be described as his theory of ontogenesis, his ground of being, or maybe even his theory of being as such. He says, I am the owner of my power, and I am so when I know myself as unique. In the unique, the owner himself returns into his creative nothing from which he is born. The creative nothing, it is mentioned only one other time in the entirety of Dainzigo and Sainagensum, the unique and its property. It is the font of individuality, yours and mine. It is a creative deposit of energy, one which we have for as long as we live. And in so far as we live, we expend the energy of this life, creatively, transgressively. But what is meant by transgression here is only in the sense of moving from ingress to egress, from entry into the world or formation to the departure out of it, across the limits of ourselves and into the world of our self-practice, into the estate of our being our property and properties. As Stirner says, I am not nothing in the sense of emptiness, but am the creative nothing, the nothing out of which I myself create everything as creator. But what are we to make of this? Sadly, Stirner does not explain this on his own terms, at least not as explicitly as would be desirable. But if we are to consider Stirner in light of his time, whom he was addressing with these works, and his philosophical education, we would find that he was educated in the Hegelian philosophy by not only Hegel, but Karl Werder, who placed a great emphasis on the beginning of Hegel's logic and the centrality of nothingness to the ontological motor of development and being. We would find that Schoener wrote articles of Hegelian nature, that he believed in the insurrectionary potential of the Hegelian system for his own ends, as in his review of Bauer's work on Hegel's atheism and that he was writing this book to essentially yell across the pub floor at fellow Hegelians. As such, let us turn to Hegel. And it would be right to do so, because it is in Hegel that we first find the productive, creative nothing at the origins of being and the development of beings. To apologise in advance, this may come across as frustratingly brief, but this is just to give you an idea of where Stirner is historically coming from. At the beginning of Hegel's logic, being and nothing 
are the same. Hegel attempts to begin the ontological logic with being, pure being. In a way, he is beginning by simply beginning, in which the thought of being and the being of this beginning simply coincide as one. At such an abstract and indeterminate level, thought and being are taken over, overcome with the nothingness that they are. The simple identity of the beginning as the beginning that begins is, is shattered by the indeterminacy, the raw nothingness of that statement. And being is shown retrospectively to always be subject to an insurgency by nothingness, by the nothing. But from this nothing, we get negation, non-being. And this divides being into the motion from being to nothingness, where thought begins and fails to begin, and vice versa, where this failure to begin itself is itself a beginning. This is how we get the operation of negation, where the nothing insurrects through being, and gives us the first division between being and its overcoming, its non-being. And this is how, for Hegel, we get determination, individuation, and the very possibility of the dialectic through which development and growth are possible. The origin of being, which shows itself to be a nothing, is hence what Hegel calls a nothing from which something is to proceed. And it is that which advances through each moment of the development of being and the existent individual as a being, who each has their own little creative nothing at their core, their little pocket of creation. Consciousness of the unique returns one to their creative nothing, because it reveals the imminent possibilities of selfhood, the radical otherness that is at the same time the closest to home. The creative nothing is the productive anarchy of being, that which opens up for new possibilities in a way that is close to the future, in terms of prediction, because it is indeterminate. Yet it is radically open to the future as the promise of what is plastic and malleable in the present. It is an explosion of self-differentiation. Stirner can be said to have identified the latent destructiveness that so many of his contemporaries saw in Hegel, and fulfilled its elucidation in the project of his works. So as to not essentially turn this brief summary into the rest of my PhD thesis, however, I'm going to round off this uh, rather dense concepts in focus with a hope that you found this interesting or helpful, and a quote from St. Max himself that many would find useful in writing about his work and the adjacent topics to his work. And this is from a footnote. To protect myself against a criminal charge, I superfluously make the explicit remark that I choose the word insurrection because of its etymological meaning and so I'm not using it in the narrow sense which is frowned upon in the penal code. Thanks for listening. It is called The Coming Insurrection. Ne soyez jamais pris dans le reste de l'eau.